Hey guys, uh, Brian here from Starlight Pulp. Thanks so much for coming by. We appreciate it. This is, uh, as the Starlight Pulp cast go, I guess this is number 11, although this is a little bit of a different one. Uh, tonight we're going to do one that is kind of an author roundtable, and it's based on the Starlight Pulp review, uh, the first one, which is out now, um, available wherever you buy your books, whether it's Barnes & Noble or our site, starlightpulp.com, or, uh, you know, that Jeff Bezos guy's site. Um, any of those that, that you feel comfortable uh, going to and buying books from. Uh, I will say this, though. Um, don't pay more than $15 for it. It's $15, so don't pay more than that, all right? Uh, so, so what we've got tonight is we've got a bunch of the authors from uh, the Starlight Pulp re first review, okay? So we've got uh, Tim Spadoni here. We have Eric Gummany. We've got Michael Bracken, Eric O'Neill, Chris Jones, James Welpley, and Jim Towns all joining us, um, all of whom have, have stories in the review. Uh, so I encourage you to pick that up. And um, and so first off, um, I'll, I'll start it off real quick. Uh, so I have a story in here called A Fresh Start. And um, the the basis of that, the, the idea behind it was, for me, was I hadn't written, I mentioned this to, to Jim when, when we did that reading a couple weeks ago. I, uh, I hadn't written in first person in a long time. I've been writing in third person for quite a bit. And so I kind of took it a little challenge upon myself to, to write a first person story kind of in the kind of in the, the, the Jim Thompson kind of vein, where um, kind of a little bit of an unreliable narrator, first person. Um, and and then aesthetically, I kind of wanted it to be uh, almost almost looking, sounding, feeling like a Western but really falling into the crime category, right? So I, uh, so I wrote this story, uh, has to do with a bunch, uh, a couple army buddies uh, who, who knew each other from uh, World War II, takes place in 1949. And uh, again, it's called A Fresh Start, has a little bit of a twist towards, uh, towards the end and, um, and is something that I had, I had a lot of fun writing. I'm going to go ahead and read just the first paragraph, and that's it, just the first paragraph, just so you guys can kind of get a feel for the language and what I was trying to set up, right? So um, anyways, it's called Fresh Start. I stepped off the bus, dropped my bag onto the road, and adjusted my hat. The town looked about as small as a postage stamp and as colorful as dirt. Then the bus hurried off as if it didn't want to be here either, and I couldn't see a damn thing but dust. When it cleared, I was as colorless as the town. If you took away the three trucks parked on the street, all whitened by desert driving, and the telephone pole standing sentinel, it could have been 1880 rather than 1949. And so again, I, I want to kind of to develop that feel of it being as much a Western as a crime novel. And so it, it kind of goes from there. Um, so, so that's a little bit about um, my story of Fresh Start. Um, let's, uh, let, let's go on to, uh, Jim Towns down there and, and talk, why don't you talk about, uh, your story? Oh, cool. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, uh, my story is called Human and Not So. It was inspired in, by, in about 1998 and 99, I lived in Jersey City, uh, and I was working in New York City, Jersey City is right across the river. And there's a little bodega, which is a little market uh, place where you corner store where you can buy everything from uh you know tic tacs to beer to meat sometimes and whatnot um nice guy and he would always you know if i was a little short on money sometimes he would give me some credit and i'd pay him back for whatever i needed and stuff because i was struggling i was bartending in the city at the time um and i'd been there about a you know going in that place for about a year and one time i go in and there's a dude laying flat on his face on the ground right in front of the front counter and he's bleeding from the head. And I look at the owner guy who I've seen many times. And he's like, oh, he tried to rob me. I call cops. He's coming. I hit him. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I'll just, I just need some, I was going to get a beer and I was going to get some potatoes and, you know, maybe some chips and, you know, so I'm going about my shopping meal. And there's a guy lying comatose <laughs> on the ground and he, and, the guy at some point says, oh, not the first time this happened. This is, this is an average Thursday night for this guy, right? <laughs> and that stuck with me. I just think the casualness of everything. Um, and I've wanted to write something about that for a while. I've wanted to put it in one, because uh, I'm a filmmaker as well. I've wanted to put a scene like that in a film for a while. And it just hasn't worked out. 
And so now 20 some years later, I come back to it. And I've had this idea for a while about a vampire that um, travels and comes around a certain part of the country the same time every year and every, or every couple years rather uh, in, in its cycle. And I thought, what if that vampire kept coming to that same bodega? And what if that vampire kept feeding on someone in that same bodega? And if that bodega was, was owned by a family, what if that vampire has come and killed a member of that family each generation, almost every 15, 20 years for generations now, for three, three generations. And so the guy owning the store, what if, what if his father and his grandmother before him have all been killed by this, this thing? And what if he knows it's coming? What if he knows it's coming back? And what if he's ready for it? And that was the genesis of the story. Um, and I just thought I was so happy, Brian, that, that it found a place in this book with so many other good stories by so many good writers. It was really fun uh, to have that. And it was great coming to the reading with you in uh, out in the desert cities and stuff and and, and meeting all the, all the people and stuff. It was cool. Oh, yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a blast. All right. So uh, good. Um, let's go to uh, Eric. Uh, Gummini, why don't you talk a little bit about your uh, your your sci-fi entry in the uh, review? Hey, yeah, uh, so my story is called One More Time Around. Uh, I don't know entirely where it came from necessarily. I've been writing since the last 10 years or so, working on the uh, Exponential Apocalypse series, which is definitely a post-apocalyptic sci-fi comedy kind of carnival book. There's a lot going on, um, but it, so that's it's kind of where I was coming from. That was my my wheelhouse, I guess. Um, but as a reader, you know, as a, a fan of movies and stuff, I don't strictly stick to sci-fi quite as hard. Um, and so I do watch a lot of crime. I've read, I was reading a lot of Elmore Leonard at the time too, and just I guess it all, you know, it kind of rubs off a little. So, uh, like you said, I was just trying to do kind of a. Uh, a more traditional noir story, just about a pair of PIs doing, you know, the missing persons case. But, uh, you know, I can't really help myself. So it just got a little weirder, a little, uh, you know, it first was, I think, the city of Los Fantasmas, which was something I've been toying with for a while, kind of a uh, Blade Runner-esque kind of, you know, tech dystopian nightmare. But then I started adding in all the, the fantasy characters. Um, one of uh you know the the partner is a minotaur there uh i don't want to give too much away but there's others in there and uh yeah and then the, the main character himself he's you know what like 500 years old or something close to it right um and that was weirdly kind of based on my own life um, i had a lung transplant about eight years ago and in in those eight years the I have cystic fibrosis, but like in those eight years, they kind of almost cured CF. So nobody is getting transplants anymore. Um, and so that was kind of a weird, I found myself in a strange place where I was suddenly like an outlier, just a, some relic of a different time and that the new, you know, the younger generations don't have to worry about that. Uh, and so I was kind of thinking about that and it, it just spawned into this guy who who had a transplant at exactly the right time and then they kind of stopped doing them because of the weird you know sci-fi math of it all he he just kept living forever um and so you know that was coming from reality a lot of it was just other stuff i cobbled together but uh, yeah i think it came out all right uh i i like the way it worked and i do think it's it's got enough of that that noir thing that i was going for that i feel really good about that one and uh yeah i think it's what I've read of the book so far, I love it. It's a great fit. So this is this is all good. Yeah, excellent, awesome, man. Well, good. I'm glad. Uh, yeah, and it, and it really does feel, in a lot of ways, like a like a mixture of of <laughs> noir and, and and sci-fi. And so, yeah, excellent. Well, definitely. If if you guys haven't read that one, check it out. Um, let's go to uh, Chris Jones. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, Derringer Deathshot? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So my story is Derringer Deathshot. It's actually an adaptation of a whole, it's an adaptation of a story that was part of a whole series called Mean Lou Green, Only Outlaws Are Free. So Mean Lou Green is the main character of the whole series. And then I took one of the stories out of it and basically rewrote the whole thing, gave it a completely different middle and ending specifically for Starlight. And what I was doing with Mean Lou Green, it was, it was, kind, of a, it was kind of a project because what I wanted to do was take 
I want to take fiction and make it more palatable for the younger audience, for people who don't read as much, who spend more time on technology, on their phones and everything like that. So what I did with Me and Lou Green is the, I, it's out on a, in a paperback right now with um, three volumes. So I released one volume at a time and each volume had 10 short stories. So the whole thing is just, is just 30 super short stories, like super, super short. Some of them were you know, maybe at 1200 words, but most of them are like 500 words, 2000 words. And it was kind of like these quick shots of just little stories and that sort of followed a general path, uh, sort of a general plot line. But it was mostly like you, you kind of get a quick bite in one story, then it jumps to the next story. And if you guys have read it, you'll see I wrote it like almost one sentence paragraphs pretty much the whole time. And part of the reason I did that was because when I was first releasing these, I did it all uh, digitally. So it was all just eBooks that people were, it was designed for people to read on their phone, right? So they can, they can download the book. I had them hosted on Gumroad. They can, they can download the first volume. They can basically read it on their phone and scroll through and it was formatted super nice for that. So it was kind of, it was kind of designed. It was like this project to try to get young people to have something cool to read, something that could give them, you know, really quick hits of, of fun and excitement and adventure and action without having to get too deep into a story. And it went through, you know, went through a whole evolution. So it does kind of follow a general plot line from beginning to end. But I kind of wrote it. I also want to be like a comic book, right? I want to be like the, a combination between a cool fiction story and a comic book where you just, you know, you get one strip and then you move to the next one and, and the next one. And it, it was really, really fun to write. I had, a, I would sit down, I would just bang out five, six, seven stories in one sitting. So it was so much fun to write. And I took a lot of inspiration from Peter Brandvold, who some of you guys probably know, he's a very prolific western author who's you know very pulpy and of all the western authors i've read he's my favorite to read because it's just it's just action it's just fun it's just you know cover to cover you enjoy the whole thing and it reads really smooth so i took a lot of inspiration from that and basically just wanted to put out something that was you know really fun not too deep just a blast to read through and and anyone you know 15 year old who's only half literate can pick it up and say hey man this is this is kind of cool i want some more of this so yeah that was that was a general idea and and I took the challenge with the challenge with adapting it to to Starlight Pulp was that none of the stories really stand alone. They're all kind of designed in the, like this web almost where you kind of need to read one to understand the other. And so the challenge was to try to find one story that could stand on its own and try to get like all the elements of Lou Green's character and of the whole general plot line in one, which is tough. And I I think it came out all right. I think you kind of get a general idea, but yeah, it was so it's kind of an interesting project. Um, if you guys like the style of Derringer Deathshot, then you know there's a whole lot more where that came from. It's a, I think it's a pretty unique thing. It's a blast to write, and you know if you don't have a whole lot of fun writing something, then I don't think anyone will have a whole lot of fun reading it. So, yeah, that's that's Derringer Deathshot. That's what me and the Green is all about. And you know, I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was a blast. Uh, it was a blast submitting. It was really cool to, you know, to get it published somewhere. And yeah, I, I enjoyed the rest of the stories too. So, cheers, man. Excellent, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so for you, because I mean, Derringer Death Shots, like, I want to say, like, eight pages or something like that. That's kind of long, right? For, <laughs> for a lot of the stuff that you write. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit long, because I, I was, yeah, I was really trying to give it, like, a totality. I was trying to make it an actual story in and of mm. itself, which was, it's not my style at all. Like, the way I write, I have no idea what I'm going to write when I sit down. I have a whole bunch of ideas for for stories and things that are going to happen and it's all these fragments and I just sit down and write it like that's that's just my process and so trying to actually sit down and like put some sort of a storyline together and some sort of a coherent beginning to end thing was a was a bit of a challenge so yeah it went on it went on a little bit long but I, I think I got enough in there cool excellent excellent good man all right well yeah um uh... Yeah, that's that's that story is a lot of fun, and I know you've you've uh, you've published a lot of the Mean Lou Green stuff now, right? So, yeah, yeah, I have I have three full volumes, so it's it's each volume. I originally did volume by volume, and then I just dumped that whole thing and put them all into one. So it's it's three volumes, but it's all in one in one book, and um and it's just thirty short stories. It's just a giant collection of you know a rollicking action adventure. <laughs> yeah, very cool. All right, all right, so let's. So let's switch gears here and let's go to uh, Tim uh, Spadoni, who uh, who Chris Jones obviously uh, very much writes writes Western and kind of fast paced uh, Westerns. Tim's has a very different feel and it's called uh, the big gray 
was a spot. spot in the Kernogel closet, right? Correct. Yeah, and it, yep. it uh, to me when I read it, it had a feel of, and I think I I mentioned this in one of our our uh, writings back and forth, but I, I it felt to me a lot like a seventies kind of horror story. Um, but along the lines, the Stephen King kind of lines where there's something going on and it's kind of weird. It's not particularly gory. It's a little strange. And, and then you have one of the things that I thought was so interesting in the story is you really bring in, uh, at least for a short story, a decent amount of physics are involved in it. So why don't you talk a bit, a little bit about it? Sure. Sure. So, uh, uh, first of all, I, I want to absolutely thank you for publishing my story. It, it was so thrilling to be chosen. I, I, I couldn't imagine that you you actually did that. That's great. And um, and and reading through the author bios and what the other fellows have accomplished, I'm I'm very impressed. Uh, so I feel very honored to be in the company of these uh, fine writers here. It's very nice. Uh, Big gray spot in the Cronago Closet. Uh, technically, I believe it's a science fiction story. Uh, yeah, I was exactly. thinking about black holes. I was thinking about micro black holes, and and they talk about micro black holes. If the Earth ever encountered one, that it would actually just pass through and it wouldn't do any damage or whatever it would do. And I and I thought, well, it, it would be interesting if if uh, somebody approached one of these, or what would they do? How how would they 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 encounter this? And then I thought, well, they're so small, you might not even see it. So I, I, I created this um, situation where I have many of them in a stabilized orbit around each other. I can't imagine it actually exists that way, but that's what I created. And they just end up in this closet. And then I went from there. What would, what, what would happen if, right? That's what we do. What would happen if? So what would happen if this stabilized grouping of micro black holes ended up in a closet in a townhouse somewhere in the suburbs. And I kind of went from there. Uh, I had a lot of fun writing it. I, I like these characters a lot. Uh, I have um, a fellow named Leo, who is not a very nice the guy that no. eventually gets his come up in some. I'm happy about that. Uh, one thing I, I am finding with my writing is I'm enjoying writing uh, female characters, which is interesting. Um, and, and in this story, I've got, a uh, two female police officers. I've got a female physicist. I've got a, uh, fire, uh, a police chief, uh, fire chief who's female and lesbian. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, thrown in the kitchen sink and all that with all these characters. And this story exists kind of like Chris, which is interesting listening to Chris. I have a larger universe of Sandy Shore. First of all, I like alliteration. So I've got Sandy Shore and I got the Cronogo Closet. It's like all this goofy mm -hmm. alliteration going on. Uh, that probably comes from my songwriting uh, background. I, I had a number of years where I've been writing songs. Um, uh, anyway, larger uh, uh, universe of Sandy Shore has many of these odd situations going on placed in very urban settings, very common setting a bar or a college or a college writing class or whatever. Uh, so I kind of like that that um, that style. And, and I liked what you said that it had the feeling of a 70s uh, story because I, I'm basically a 70s guy. So that's <laughs> why <laughs> that happened. So yeah. Uh, and I hope to uh, have my collection finished uh, sometime early next year, possibly put it out as, 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 as a collection. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And and yeah, Leo really is a bit of a schmuck. Yes, he is, isn't he? Yes, he is. he's not a nice guy. He is. He's, he's, a, he's, he's a bad man. He is. He bad, is not, bad, bad, bad. He is not particularly <laughs> likable in any way. But no, uh, not at all. Right. But it works. It, it, it works for the story. So <laughs> good. Good. Okay, uh, Eric O'Neill, let's 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 move over to you. You you've got a story in here called uh, Bessie Lou's First Dance. Is that right? Mm -hmm, that's right. That's correct, right? And, uh, and and like I said before, it feels a little bit to me almost like a uh, 
almost like a uh, Twilight Zone episode where it, it it's it's kind of short and dirty and, and happens pretty quickly, but you get kind of a lot of the context of, of, of what's going on in this small town. So why don't you why don't you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I it's interesting that you bring that up because I almost feel like it's a little bit more Night Gallery just because Night Gallery scares me more than Twilight Zone because <laughs> <laughs> um, this one definitely gets gets nasty in the in the twist uh, that I won't go into. But um, I, I first and foremost, thank you for publishing me. This is my first uh, published e thing ever. Um, awesome. So it was really nice to 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 see that I I got something in there, and then especially, I mean, not just hearing you guys talk now, and then also reading all the, uh, the um, author bios. Uh, it, it's so cool to me that I am among you guys. I mean, Tim took the words right out of my face. So um, it's 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 really nice to be amongst all you other guys. And I got through most of the book. The only reason I had to stop in the last three wasn't because they were too long is because I got COVID. You can probably hear it in my voice, <laughs> um, but I will get to them. And everything up till then, it was just like, oh my God, this is better than the last. Oh my God, this is better than the last. So um, I'm really looking forward to finishing the, the review itself. Um, obviously I had to read mine a couple of times, uh, for <laughs> but um <laughs> Yeah, Bessie Lou, um, Bessie Lou's first dance came from, I, now that I'm a published writer, I commit a cardinal sin of not reading enough. Um, what I've been doing is a couple of Christmases ago, my brothers-in-law gave me a full collection of H.P. Lovecraft. And I said, you know what, screw it, it's time to start getting through it. Um, and I've been reading it while I've been at work. I work night shift. Um, labor and delivery and some you know it's feast or famine there and, and so some nights i could just read like five or six stories before i get bleary and have to walk around and so bessie lou's story really was me trying to go well i wonder if i can create a lovecraft type story um where i have a monster where i have this this world that's like the more you learn about it the more you're like oh 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 no um and uh, and so that's why I put in little things like all the animals, uh, aside from like a couple of animals that I, I didn't go back and, and change, they're not real. It's like, I want the reader to go, da, 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 what the heck is that? And then there's no explanation. Um, and and the you know the idea of like oh there's a dance every year and everybody's like oh cool it's a dance and then they quietly talk about this weird thing where the moon just freezes in the sky for 12 hours and the dance is 12 hours long and we just gloss right over that um i, I wanted as many weird details that like a surface level reader would just kind of be like oh that's weird and pass by and anyone who's really looking at it could go why <laughs> um and and that way it would it would make it a little bit more interesting and I think I think my philosophy for for telling like monster stories is you can either uh, fully describe the monster and make it super unsettling which I'm I'm trying to do I'm working on two separate uh, collections of short stories right now where Bessie Lou actually came from my horror collection that I'm still trying to fix up um but uh, my other collection is all about like religion and death and fun stuff. Um, I am trying to submit that for publication. Um, but I, in, in the horror ones, like sometimes you just got to describe the monster and make it in such a way that if you saw it in real life, you, it, you you'd be terrified. It would be the worst experience ever. And sometimes I think you need to describe the monster as little as possible or as confusingly as possible. So the way that I describe the monsters here, I mean, even like beat number one, the, the moment that you see the monster and you don't necessarily know it's the monster something weird happens that that in you know you could brush it off very easily or you might be like wait wait was that on purpose and it was <laughs> that was my intent for for all of it um so yeah, I mean, otherwise, uh, like I said, Lovecraft is a big inspiration. Another big inspiration for me, my wife found this podcast on Spotify. It's called Old Gods of Appalachia. Um, it's a horror anthology podcast. It's incredible. It started just before the pandemic um, hit and it's still ongoing now. It's really, really well done. It's honestly like I, I imagine some of these stories being read by their authors and, and it, it's it's all about like elder gods and, and witches and, and stuff set in Appalachia. Um, and they've got a couple of big name actors popping up in there. Luri, uh, Yuri Lowenthal, who plays Marvel Spider-Man in the PS4 game. He plays a big villain. Um, it's excellent. I highly recommend you guys uh, go check it out. But that was another big inspiration because right when I was starting to write this and get into my horror phase, when I was like in the middle of reading Lovecraft, um, my wife showed it to me and I've just been like hooked out. I'm on, I'm on season two now. And it's, it's, 
that was a big reason why I got through Bessie Lou's first dance. And, and uh, you know, addition to like um, sending it off to my parents for them to read it and edit it and talking over the ending with my friends because I, I had ran by the like the idea for the ending. What I'll usually do when I write mm -hmm. is I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know the beginning and I'm pretty sure I know the ending. But sometimes when I don't know the ending, I'm like, look, I've got like two or three endings. Can you guys help me out which one's scariest? And I'll run it by them and they'll go, oh, I like that one. And as they're talking about it, I'm like, nope, screw both of them. I got a better one. <laughs> <laughs> that's just what usually ends up happening and this is this is one of those one of those cases where i had a couple and just went for a totally different one um but i think it really worked because it got me published so yeah <laughs> thank you of course man yeah absolutely and 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 congratulations on that i can i can i can tell you as somebody who who has has had has gone through the experience of, of a few times obviously everybody here as well but um i was a poet for a long time um, now I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it's like an AA thing. I'm, I'm, I'm a recovering poet, but I, uh, getting my first poems published way back, I mean, I'm talking 20 plus 25 years ago or something, but, uh, it was, you know, you try and you try and you try and you just, you get rejected so many times. It's not even funny. And then all of a sudden, bam, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, it, it can happen, you know? And then all of a sudden after a while it starts happening pretty often and and then it same thing with with short stories later on so it it's a it's an awesome experience um i congratulate you as well as tim on that and i think that's fantastic and um and it is an interesting thing too and i know jim probably would have a lot to say on this because jim 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 traffics in uh in the horror genre in in every way making being that he's made multiple feature length films on it uh as well but um, one of the things that is so interesting about the Lovecraft thing and, you know, with, with, uh, Cthulhu and, and, and so many of the other gods there, um, when you talked about how making them as scary as possible, we're not even supposed to be able to, to manifestly take in what they are without going completely insane. Like we're not even able to function when we, when we experience what they are. So so that you know there is a lot to be said for for letting a little bit go sometimes and then you know being as descriptive as possible when you when you need to so right right okay yeah good awesome uh so so michael let's go over to you now now i do want to point out here something that is that is remarkable in that um eric you just had your 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 first story published and i'm 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 humbled and honored that that uh you're you're in the review uh so so thank you for that Michael, on the other hand, Michael has something around what, twelve hundred short stories that you've written. Yeah, I've, I've published about twelve hundred short stories and a handful of novels. Okay, so yeah, that's a lot. So, so <laughs> that it in this one in 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 the review you've got uh, you've got kissing cousins, which, like I said, is pretty pretty straight down the line. It's it's straight crime noir. It's set up. It it does that thing very well which a lot of short stories do. It sets itself up pretty much in the first paragraph and uh, sees it through all the way through. And, and, and by the end, you, you, you finish it and you go, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it, that, that's a fitting end. That's how it should end. So why don't you talk a little bit about, about Kissing Cousins? Well, I don't write anything like Corn Cornell Woolrich, but one thing he writes, a trope he uses often, is a character is pretending to be someone they aren't. And that was the starting point of this story. Uh, an actor who, who's had negligible success is hired by a woman to pretend to be her missing cousin. And because grandma is near death's door, hasn't seen the missing cousin in years, and but is leaving everything to him. And so if he comes back and pretends to be the missing cousin, um, then she would, you know, split the money with him, basically. And so, you know, his career is not going real well. He's getting room and board and a stipend to live on just to pretend to be this guy. So she runs him through uh, the character's history, what he's done, where he is supposed to have been and all that and moves him into grandma's uh, mountaintop uh, house. And grandma believes that it's him. and. So one of the things that I want to do that's different in a traditional noir story, you often have the femme fatale, and then you have the good girl next door. 
Well, I twisted that. I've got two femme fatales. Um, and things happen. I don't want to give the story away, but um, things go from good to worse to great to worse. So, yeah, excellent. So, so tell me this then. So you've got, um, you've got novels out. You, you, you've published a whole bunch of short stories. And I know that you also uh, are an editor at times. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so if you had uh, one piece of advice for the younger writers on here, uh, what would that be? Only one? Um, <laughs> Give us as much as you can. <laughs> The most important piece of advice, and it goes contrary to what one of our other panelists just kind of said is, nobody needs to like your story except two people. You have to like it enough to submit it to somebody and one editor somewhere in the world has to like it enough to publish it. It doesn't matter what your critique group thinks, it doesn't matter what your parents think, it doesn't matter what your spouse thinks, you have to like it and one editor has to like it. So everything else, I mean, Great if your parents like it. Great if your pastor likes it. Great if the next door neighbor likes it. But they're not buying it and publishing it. So you got to put, you got to write it. You got to put it out there, and you got to keep looking for that editor. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, the the uh, I just read a quote the other day uh, from Rick Rubin, um, the the music producer, right? And who's who's done everybody, just about every genre imaginable, um, from Slayer to you know LL Cool J and and, and uh, Beastie Boys um to tom petty and everybody in between but uh the quote was the best way to serve the audience is to ignore them <laughs> and, and and i thought when i read it i thought oh that's that's a great way of looking at it because it it really is at the end of the day all about you if you don't like what you write if you're not your best audience you're writing for the wrong thing yep it really is about that now of course ultimately it's great when other people like it as well. But the fact of the matter is that you have to pretend you're not writing for anybody. You're just writing for you. And do you like it? And if that's the case, then, then you're usually, usually pretty good. So, all right, well, excellent. Thank you, Michael, so much. Uh, and then, and then also uh, last here, I think, la so we'll, we're going to go to James here in a minute and then we'll do a little Q and a session and then, then we'll get you guys out of here after that. Okay. But, um, but there might be some writers that want to ask other writers things, so we'll go to that in a minute too. But uh, James, why don't, why don't you come on and talk about uh, the boss's daughter? Now, um, the boss's daughter features uh, Mickey Fairfax, who is in um, both your novels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I changed his name for this one, though. Yeah, I know you did, but so I, <laughs> I did. Uh, I'm James uh, Welpley. I, I wrote the boss's daughter. Uh, boss's daughter is actually. Uh, adapted for starlight pulp from my first novel dancing in the trap which did feature my uh my recurring character mickey fairfax who is a a former merchant marine turned kind of reluctant uh reluctant detective reluctant amateur detective i guess uh for so for this one i, I really just kind of stripped all that away and i made the guy a straight you know identifiable trench coat and hat raymond chandler dashiell hammett style detective uh uh, which I was really, really happy to see all the, the diversity in, uh, in everyone else's stories, because mine is pretty much that that archetype detective. And, and I think if there was a whole review full of that, you know, you can only have so many like hookers and pimps in stories before it starts to be like really, really one note. So I was really, really happy reading everybody's stuff. I mean, it's so creative. And then uh, mine gets to come in there and, you know, be the guy that that we've all seen a million times with the, with a trench coat and hat. But uh you know, I kind of went the other way with it. The first thing in the detective genre that I really read was Raymond Chandler's Killer in the Rain. And it was a collection of short stories. But in that collection, it has all of the seeds for what became his longer fiction. So I think I just went in the other direction. I took my long fiction and I boiled it down. Uh, so what I got to do with that is I, I kind of took away a lot of the character development that went into to Mickey Fairfax about him being an orphan, about him being a former merchant marine, about him not knowing, you know, the place where he is. The whole place, the whole thing takes place in Paris. He's a complete fish out of water. You know, he's not, he doesn't know the streets like, you know, Raymond Chandler's characters are all uh, Hollywood and, and LA and San Francisco. And they know the streets like the back of their hands. Like he doesn't even speak French and he's here, you know, trying to, to solve this murder and, and blackmail plot, uh, which 
I, I, I kind of took the, uh, the frame of it from Big Sleep, where there is this criminal organization and they are responsible for these, these things that happen during the story, but they're not responsible for the one thing that, that really happens in that story. Uh, so that was the, the kind of framework that I worked with for, uh, for Dancing in the Trap. But for uh, Boss's Daughter, since I was paring everything down, I had to make it a lot cleaner and a lot smoother. So I took away some of the, the characterization. I took away some of the bits, which I think was really my purpose for writing in the first place. I, I don't think I ever wanted to be a writer. All I think I've ever wanted to be was funny. And writing and writing like a detective story was kind of a way to, to do like these little vaudevillian bits. And I love turns of phrase and I love kind of little gags and uh and writing those into a story it was like the reason to have the story so adapting it for this like I, I stripped a lot of that away and it really had to be more story oriented and it had to be fast and had to be clean it couldn't have too many twists uh mine's still you know a fifth of this book so it's, it's a lot longer than everybody else's I feel like a cheater uh I promise the next one I'll, I'll try to write something shorter but uh it's a, it, this was fantastic. And again, my narrow view of pulp being like detective noir was just completely wrong and, and completely like flipped on its head. And I loved reading all the Westerns in here and all the sci-fi stuff, which, uh, you know, I've read like Louis L'Amour, but I haven't read enough Westerns, uh, reading blood Meridian now. Uh, and I, I've read, um, Heinlein, but I haven't read enough sci-fi. So it was really, really cool reading all you guys uh, stuff and, and, uh, and how creative, it is, and it really just gets the juices flowing for something that I, I might want to write outside of the detective genre. Awesome, and and you know, the, so so James does something because he he he's been on the podcast. So we we had a we had a uh, you know hour long chat or whatever uh, a few months ago, and and James does this crazy thing where well, crazy in my eyes. Um, it obviously works for him, but he wrote an entire novel that takes place in France and never went to France. Like that to me is, is, is crazy. His second book is, is Tenerife, which is in Tenerife where I'm going to have James tell you where that is. Um, and he's never been there either. So, so the amount of research that you need to do for that, but then also just the, ballsiness of being sure you're going to pull it off is is really saying something because i'm not saying you have to go visit every place you're going to write about that's not the case but if you're going to but if you're going to set an entire novel in a place most of the time you're going to want to see it and 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 you know i had uh quay quarte on the uh podcast a few weeks ago and he actually writes about west africa a lot and his experience was the opposite of James in that, in that he actually goes to the West, uh, West African countries and has and hires people to take him around so that he sees all the sites. James wrote these without ever being there. And I'm not knocking that at all. I'm saying that's amazing. So, you know, uh, so that that's uh, that's that's something. So so and the boss's daughter is really uh, you you really like uh as as do I, uh, but the the detective fiction one liners, you really do well with that. So. Oh yeah, I mean that whole like kind of vaudevillian cadence and uh, you know the, the fast back and forth and and then just the characters that come from that. I mean everybody loves those things. Everybody's favorite Bugs Bunny cartoons are the ones with like the mobsters in them and and the old Hollywood guys in them. And everybody's favorite part of any, you know, black and white movie is some rapid fire exchange between two characters. And that was a, that just, that kind of rhythm. I just wanted to kind of hone in on it and, and sort of make it my own. Like you can go read a bunch of, of, of hard boiled fiction or, you know, watch Brick or whatever and pick up on all this lingo and try to regurgitate it. But what I really try to do is, is sort of, I don't rely on that. And not, not, I'm not calling everybody like yeggs. I'm not calling cops bulls and everything. I'm trying to come up with sort of a carve out of vernacular. That's not, not my own, but just maybe one that hasn't been done to death. And uh, just, I want it to be in my voice and yeah, I'm not born in 1940. So I had to kind of, to kind of yeah. update it and, and yeah. make it a little fresh. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, something you said there that I, that I loved uh, was, was that, your perspective your your view of pulp was when when you hear pulp you think detective fiction right i do yeah and, 
and generally speaking, I think a lot of people do. But but when you think about the pulps, right, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, the pulps were all of it. I mean, literally, it just meant to be written on cheap paper. And right. to be written on cheap paper were the books that you bought at the five and dime store and at the gas station. And those were sci-fi, horror, noir romance i guess but yeah. <laughs> but you know but yeah, uh romance. we we didn't get any of those uh stories in romance thank goodness <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean those all of those all of those fall under the you know the umbrella of of pulp so um and uh, you know we kind of wanted to make people aware of that so anyways awesome job everybody here i appreciate you uh i appreciate each and every one of you and 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 thank you for coming on now are, th are there any questions that any of you have for anybody else here i, I wish charlie was here because i had a question for him. <laughs> on the independence day story yeah yeah that's a cool story i remember reading it i read i read, the, read through the whole thing you know, I, I burned through it as soon as it came in the mail and uh i'm gonna be tracking all you people down on social media but uh, yeah i was hoping charlie was gonna be here yeah what was the question uh, i had i had it written down i don't want to if he's not gonna be here to answer i don't want to ask it <laughs> okay okay got it um yeah charlie jones it's it's uh, independence day 1992 whole thing takes place in, in philadelphia and uh it's a real it's a real tight um tightly wound uh little little uh De detective story that that works pretty well i think um obviously i i, I thought charlie was going to be with us tonight he's not so that's a bummer but uh but yeah anybody else any questions well you kind of glossed over it but are you actually open to pulp romance stories i mean gosh um i made a good part of my living writing those stories i think i i'm not gonna say no I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say no. I, if it's something that, you know, Fabio might have been on the cover for in the 80s, probably not. But, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I that's think not, that... That's not that, pulp. Well, yeah, exactly. I think if there's other things going on, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Nice gentle erotica. <laughs> 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 like with the swamp thing or something. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? All right, guys. Well, buddy, well I, uh, yeah, I, Tim. yeah. If um, if if we have any questions for each other, uh -huh. um, Brian, would you mind if we sent you an email and asked to forward that off to somebody? No, of course not. Then, you know, maybe we can exchange emails or something. Whatever. Yeah. Absolutely no. Feel Great. free. I mean, like I said before, my whole my whole point of 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 starting starlight with with uh with with my my other guys here was to uplift and assist other writers and get the whole pulp brand out there so absolutely i'll be more than happy to any of you guys can can always email me or you know hit me up on social media whatever and uh and and let me know okay um okay. And I'll be happy. I actually have a I have a question for uh, Eric, but I don't want to ask it here. It's a more something one of my stories. I think you can help me with. Sure. Yeah. No. Sounds good. good. And, and again, that's perfect. That's 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 the point of all this stuff is that we oftentimes as writers don't really have a community in a lot of ways. We have mm -hmm. a select, very small group of people that we show our stories to, and you know, and then we get them published, and then we read them or we don't. But oftentimes we don't even know the other authors who are in the collections. And so what we're, you know, what we're trying to do with something like this is to, is to get to know people a little bit, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, I, I'll be more than happy to, to forward anything on that, that you guys want. All right. That'd be great. I, uh, I read, I, I watched um, Dan Brown's uh, series on writing on masterclass. And he said, uh, don't be afraid to ask people uh, and they'll, they'll be willing to talk to you. And I kept thinking to myself, yeah, yeah, but you're Dan Brown. When yeah, Tim right. Spinoni, you know, goes to somebody, then you know, maybe they're not that open. Yeah. But uh, yeah. it would be great to. And 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 you know what? You're always gonna you're always gonna run into some people that don't want to do that. You mm -hmm. know, you will. Man, that that just is what it is. Sometimes, you know, I mean, my my dad was a was a gallery artist, and 
and he was a wonderful, wonderful painter, a fantastic artist, but very much, you know, he didn't want to talk to other people. <laughs> like, you know, so, so, you know, it's, you're always going to have some artists like that. They, they don't, uh, they don't want to share. It's their world and that, and that's okay. You know, but, but there's, but you'll run into a, a heck of a lot more that, that are willing to, to talk craft and trade and process mm-hmm. and things like that than, than, than are not. So, uh, yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. How about it? Great. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate each and every one of you for coming by tonight. Um, go, uh, I, I hope, hope you guys enjoy the review. Um, we will have uh, submissions open for the second one coming in February, and then we've got a short story collection we're looking for as well. So um, submissions will open up for that in February. If you are watching this later on on YouTube, first off, thank you for still being here. Secondly, uh, Starlight Pulp Review number one is on uh, any number of uh, sites wherever you buy your books. Uh, if you go to Amazon, do not pay $25 for it, please. Uh, pay 15 That's how much it should be. <laughs> Uh, you can also go to starlightpulp.com, buy it there, or uh, Barnes & Noble has it for $15. So uh, go someplace and buy it. These guys are, are all awesome. The stories are a lot of fun, and I appreciate each and every one of you guys for being here. Thank you. In this topsy turn